people have found that's, that's obvious is oxidative, what's called oxidative stress. And you're eating uh, an oxidant, and it's, this stuff is very toxic that way, and you end up, um, uh, if you have other uh, antioxidants like vitamin D and what, not vitamin D, vitamin E, uh, you can actually survive a, a little bit of this, uh, this hazard. But um, I think that's the main me mechanism of action in the acute sense. You're killing yourself with this oxidant, basically. Uh, if you if you were to do it, and there's millions and millions. I mean, the, the literature is as long as your own. How many? What's the LD50 of this stuff? LD50 is the lethal dose 50. How much does it take to kill something? Rats, mice, pigeons, worms, whatever it is. Okay, and it's very high, low toxicity. You have to add a lot of the chemical in the diet of these of these uh, various animals to kill them. So it has a low toxicity, and that was really so. You take low toxicity. Uh, specificity against plants, you got yourself a home run, as far as the chemical industry is concerned. That's the way it is. It's fine. Nothing to worry about. They do all these tests with um, the phosphate can be labeled with P32, which is a radioactive element, and the carbon can be labeled with C14. You want to know about C14 age, uh, uh, age mm -hmm. determinations, whatever it's called. Um, and they are excreted. Within a day or two, you have peed it out or pooped it out. It's gone. It doesn't stay in your system at all. It's not held. Except, this is interesting, I, I found this one thing. Oh, it's the only place you ever find a little bit of bone. Okay. <laughs> you watch this. This bone thing is a big deal, I think, mean, because that's going to be the problem, if, if I would guess. Um, the breakdown, that the, and the key thing is it doesn't even alter itself in your body. It's not even changed. It comes out the way it went in when you, when you ingest this stuff. So it's really broken down. It's broken down a little bit, and that's the dephosphorylation route, the one where you just lose the phosphate uh, in rats. And uh, it has very few problems as far as human health is concerned. And that's why this, the, you know, the, the background buzz is this no big deal here. So what about long-term low-dose problems? And I want to have some fun with you on this one. This is my, this is my assay. <laughs> It's got a cool name. I hadn't even heard about this until about a week ago when I started looking into this. It's called the comet assay. Now, isn't that nice? The comet assay? So the question is, does it have any long-term effects? And that's really what we're, what we're kind of stuck with. We don't have um, toxicity as our weapon. It, they obviously wouldn't have gotten as far as they had if they killed everything that they fed it to, right? That would be the end of it. So the fact that it's, it has survived those initial tests of toxicity and specificity of plants means that they're going to go for this thing big time, as Rod has already pointed out. Okay, so last year, around July, the World Health Organization came out with this thing saying this is a carcinogen. And whoa! Heads blew up all over the place. And our friend Lee Ritter is... <laughs> Is, the, is one of the chief bl he blown heads, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> He's out of his mind right now. Like, don't mess with me on this stuff. Uh, so this guy, Chris, he's a Brit. Chris Poitier. Uh, maybe he's a Brit, man. I he was a Brit. Maybe he's not. He's got a French name, but Chris is maybe French. Uh, it says it's a probable carcinogen. Okay? And genotoxic means it's damaging to DNA and so forth, and so there's no safe, safe level of exposure. That's an interesting argument. I think that's, that may be the key that pulls the plug on this stuff, if you think about that. So a lot of chemical reactions require a certain concentration to be effective, to be toxic, even to produce cancer. Anything, you know, pollution, dilution is a pollution to solution, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> dilution is a solution to pollution. So if you take anything and dilute it down to homeopathic levels, you're done with it. It doesn't hurt you, theoretically. Um, but there are elements, there are things like radioactivity, which if it hits your nucleus, if it hits the DNA and breaks a strand, that's, that's a reaction you can't, there's no dose required. You know what I mean? It's like, bingo, done. There's no getting around it. It happened, and you didn't need a big concentration of radioactivity to do this. You just need one hit, and it's done. So the chemistry of this thing may be that kind of a chemistry. If it gets into your nucleus and it damages your DNA, it, the concentration is irrelevant. It's just low, yeah, there's a low, lower chance of it having, a, having an effect. But the higher it gets, the more chance it does have an effect. 
Now, this is a really key, uh, amazing experiment. This is done in Brazil. Genetic damage in soybean workers exposed to pesticides. The comment uh, uh, assay is, is in this one. And this is all glyphosate. So th this is real stuff. I mean, I have other papers I'll show you in a second. But this is the real deal. This is actual people supposedly working with a, a harmless pesticide in the field in Brazil who are being, they're taking samples from their, from their throats and they're testing them for, the, for this, in this comet assay. There's another couple. This goes back to 2007. I was amazed to see this. It's the same thing. There's the, there's the uh, comet essay in 2007. Nobody said a thing about this. It's just the exact same experiment. And then this is the, the, the World Health Organization's uh, you, declaration. Can you find comet essay? I'm coming. It's coming. The comet essay is going to blow your mind. Here it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. OK, so imagine this. You're going to take a single cell. You can isolate single cells from the, from the uh, respiratory tract. You can isolate them from culture. So most of the stuff is done in culture. You take single human cells. You can grow them in culture for a while until they poop out on you. Or you can take these permanent cell lines that people have been working on, like HeLa cells forever and ever and ever. And you grow these cells in media. And then at some point, you treat them while they're growing with this agent, whatever agent you're going to be testing. The assay is looking for single strand breaks in the DNA. So you all know that your chromosomes are, there's 20 something chromosomes and there's pairs of them and each chromosome is a single humongous piece of DNA. The, me, the DNA in every single cell of your body is over a meter long. It's incredible to think about that. All <clears throat> collapsed and coiled, pulled up in, inside your nucleus. So what we're going to be looking at is this double stranded molecule, which is theoretically perfectly double-stranded, has no breaks in it. You can't replicate broken DNA, right? It, 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 it has all kinds of other effects. We'll talk about that later. So what we're looking for is this chemical hitting the DNA and breaking one strand. Now, if you were to take this stuff and run it in what we call a gel, if it was native, it was base pair DNA, if you had a nick in it, so what? It doesn't matter. It's not going to show on, on the acid because the strands are still held together by hydrogen bonds. The, the base pairs are still all held together in a double helix, right? You put a nick in, it doesn't really matter. If you cut through both strands at the same place, you'd get a break, but you don't usually do that. You're going to get single strand breaks. Okay, so we're going to do an assay that says if you have a single strand break and we can separate these two strands into two separate DNA strands and there's a break now in one of them, that break will show, because it's now two separate pieces, where it used to be one big piece, even though it had a nick. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. So little pieces will start to show up. Okay, so you, play, you mobilize the cells, you dissolve. This is the cool part, because you're just taking a single cell. It's a grown cell. It's been treated with a chemical. And you are embedding it in auger, a low melting temperature agros, which is basically, you know, algae give you agro, agar. You all, you've been cooked with auger, right? So augros is just a fancy name for this scientific stuff. And so what happens is the cell is kind of, it, it is surrounded with this web of sugars. I mean, auger is just a sugar, right? A long polysaccharide. So you get surrounded. You can't move. You can't move. You're sort of trapped in this thing. You're just a cell. But you're in perfectly good media. You're happy. The stuff is, you know, the liquids are coming and going. It's a very loose uh, network. Now, you treat the cells with a lysis solution. That's over here. Now what this is going to do is going to, first of all, it's got detergent in it, so it breaks the cells down. So instead of being a nice intact cell, I'm just going to go blah, and all my guts are just going to be in this little <laughs> sphere, right? Just in a, a, in a pocket, essentially. And then I'm going to add sodium hydroxide to that mixture. Sodium hydroxide is a base. It's caustic soda, right? And high pH denatures DNA. You get pH around 12, 13, DNA becomes single-stranded. Now the breaks can show. Okay? Now you got the little pieces showing up. And if you take that and you put that slide in an electrical field, the phosphates in DNA, every, every base is joined to another base of the phosphate, so it's got a negative charge. If you put a positive electrode on one end of this slide and the negative electrode on the other end, the DNA will migrate, if it can, toward the, the positive charge. Okay? Negative goes to positive. Mm -hmm. Pretty simple stuff. So you get this thing that looks like a comet. This is the comet. 
Isn't that cool? I love that. <laughs> that was the coolest thing for a thing for an essay ever. And even I could understand it, right? So there's the essay. So basically what happens is if you have any breaks at all, they start to show up as a little blib. The more breaks, the more the comet grows until the tail is until it's all tail, basically. There's nothing left. So here's the Here's the story. There is the, the various stages of decay. Treated but not broken. No treatment. There's no treatment here. This is what a cell would normally look like. The DNA d does not move. It's this giant tangle of DNA. No little pieces coming off of it. And they stay put. They can't get out of this matrix. It, the Algaro's matrix is holding them. But then as the, as the single strands start to show up more and more and more, you get this comet tail until it's very severe. This is the group four. So in these workers, I don't know how, I didn't bring the slide of the numbers, but you can see that on the web. The workers had something like, in, in the, um, the controls, there was 30% of these, uh, of, of the, uh, the cells were in this, were in this stage, most of them, 70% were in that stage, and nothing was down here at all, there were no breaks like this at all. And then when they went to the, uh, the treated cells, the, the ones that were uh, from, from the, uh, the guys in the, in the field, they started seeing at, at these higher concentrations, 70% of these guys had breaks like that. It was amazing. Like, holy crow, this, this is really serious stuff. They're getting single strand breaks. Why is that important? Well, the, the, the papers don't talk about the breaks being uh, lethal or anything like that. They're not lethal, but they can produce cancer by a very circuitous method. Um, if you take the, the way oh, virus, you know what an oncogene is? Anybody heard of an oncogene now? There are genes that cause cancer. We're in, we all have them. Every gene, every person in this room has cancer genes. There are about 50 of them now that have been isolated. They're isolated with viruses. They're isolated because a virus would pick them up out of the genome and turn them on with their own promoter, their own guy that tells them to go. And they would cause, a can they would cause cancer in the cell they infected. It's simple. So we have all these oncogenes in us. And so what, what's holding back, what prevents cancer from happening in all our cells, is that these cancerous genes are growth genes. They're normal. They're required for growth. What's cancer? Cancer is turning them on all the time. If you were to take a, a, a plate of cells and start with one cell, in about a week or two, you would have a monolayer of cells, and it stops growing. Contact inhibitions. They're really basic things that have been around for 150 years. Take cell culture, grow the cell, start with one, fills the plate with one layer of cells, and they stop. They, they know that they have a neighbor, it's time to stop. If you get a tumor, if you infect that plate with a virus carrying a tumor gene, then you get this mound of stuff where the cells just start growing and growing and form a mound because they're not stopping. They're cancerous. Okay? So when you start, what, what the, 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 the take-home lesson from these broken uh, uh, chromosomes is that when you take a chromosome and you put a nick in it, and it comes time to go through cell division, which all your cells are doing pretty well all the time, except your brain, then when the cells are dividing, they're replicating through these breaks, and, they, and the chromosome is single-stranded from one, and it falls apart. Both strands are replicated mm -hmm. at the same time. So when you start breaking it, you hit a nick in one strand, that strand lets go. All right, so now you've got a free end, and a free end of a chromosome in your body is deadly, can be deadly. Because what happens is it joins up to another nick on another chromosome. You get a chromosome abnormality, and suddenly you've got this quiet little housekeeping cancer gene, oncogene, which has been quiet the way it should be, is now hooked up to somebody else's really hot promoter. And it just goes and goes and goes. It makes that protein too much, and you get cancer. That's a lot of what cancer is about. Is cancer is taking cells, uh, genes that are normally quiet. You can mutate them, which is one way of doing this. But you can also remove the old quiet promoter, and turn, which is turning it on properly, and give it a hot promoter, and it just goes and goes and kills you. So that's the worry. I think that's, this is the big deal. I don't know. Uh, nobody has, has mentioned that possibility yet, but this is how you get cancer. And so I think it's a big deal. That's why I thought we should talk about the, the common assay. There's a really nice one. So you can see how they, mm -hmm. how they quantify it. So that pretty well does it. Um, it's the most widely used herbicide in the world. It has low to acute toxicity. Uh, in chronic assays, it shows very few problems. It's excreted. 
rapidly. It's, it breaks down in soil and water. Uh, forestry and agriculture are completely sold on it. You don't have to be told that already. There's another part that I didn't have time to go into that everybody knows about, and that is that when you, you don't use Roundup by itself. It's a pure chemical, and nobody uses it anymore. They need to get through the waxy covering of plant leaves. So what they do is they put surfactants in it. There's a thing called POME or something like that, which is used as a, a commonly used uh, surfactant. And uh, these things acutely raise the toxicity of this uh, glyphosate. Uh, so in every insect, I mean everything that's been tested, if you add the, the, if you test the formulations that are actually used, you find them much more toxic than you find the actual chemical glyphosate by itself. Um, so resistance is, is coming. Glyphosate has a lifespan of whatever it is until it becomes no longer useful. And so there's already a, there's a paper in the, in the folder. I, I guess you'll see the folder on the on the Dropbox. I sent all my stuff as a folder to uh, Maggie, and she's not there today, so she didn't forward it to you. I didn't know that. So uh, the um, there's a there's a new formulation that's going to go very big, and it's going to have both 2,4-D and glyphosate in it at the same.